I believe I have a word of the Lord for you today. Now, what goes with that is going to be entirely up to the interaction of the Holy Spirit. Um, it's one of those subjects that I've been dealing with, but in prayer time this morning, the Holy Spirit just spoke one sentence to me. Each successive generation has its own exodus. But this generation is unlike any other generation that has ever been. But here we go back to the statement of the Holy Spirit that each successive generation, well, how old is a generation? Well, it varies, but it, you, could, you could call a generation, say, 100 years old, 90 years old, 80 years old, whatever it pleases you. But when one generation passes away, another one takes its place. But the one that takes its place is not the same as the one that it replaces. I'm making you think a little bit now, okay? Because you can't grow if you don't think. You can't make smart decisions if you don't carefully research what you're planning to invest in. Now, if you choose to invest in a ministry like this, you will be challenged. But I'll add a caveat to that. That's a Latin word meaning an adjunctive uh, uh, addition. The caveat is that at the same time you will be tested and tried and challenged, you will be rewarded. How do I know that? Whenever you sow interest, passion, dedication, you will reap wealth, spiritual wealth, financial wealth, physical well-being, but you've got to go where you can be fed. I said to somebody this morning, salvation needs to be fed, F-E-D. You'd have to invest in your salvation. And if you invest in your salvation, guess what? God invests in you. What will happen is things are said that go into your spirit that don't immediately change you, but they will change you because words create. Now, all you've got to have is an open heart. If you're bitter and unforgiving and jealous and stingy, you're sowing seed, all right, but it's not good seed. So turn over the book of Exodus for a second, and let's just have a look at something here. And I want to touch two or three things concerning every successive generation has its own exodus. This generation, our generation, there's probably two or at least three generations of folks that are sitting here today that have different opinions about things, but we all share the one opinion in that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. And in his name, all things are possible because God the Father hath authorized him to be the head. Therefore, as you and I grow in our understanding of these last days and the fact that our stance and our departure from this world system which is the sect of the same we're going to read in a minute. We've read it before, but briefly. Pharaoh, obviously, <clears throat> for a short season, Pharaoh, during the time of Joseph, the Pharaoh of that time invested all of his trust in Joseph because Joseph had favor with God and he was smart. Joseph went to work for Pharaoh and Pharaoh built an enormously powerful and wealthy kingdom. But it wasn't really Pharaoh. It was Joseph. Oh, this is so good. Listen to this. We've been talking <clears throat> about in the last days when, when um, let's get back and back, where the Exodus came and God raised up Moses in his generation toward the end of his generation. 80 years he spent goofing off. Finally got a hold of Moses, told Moses after he saw that burning bush, take your sandals off of your feet. Why did he do that? Well, he said, you're on holy ground. Eh, why did he do that? Because that transition that was about to take place was going to remove him from the world system and bring Moses into full-time service with God. Now think about Joseph beforehand. What was Joseph doing? Working for Pharaoh. That's right. What was Joseph doing for Pharaoh? Running the whole kingdom. He was his chief financial officer, his CFO. Pharaoh says, whatever he tells you to do it, you do it. And I'll just sit back and count the money, which he did. Pharaoh who came in after that Pharaoh, and that, I forget, it was Ramses the second or the third that was with Pharaoh, they think. And he was actually broke. Pharaoh was broke. The whole kingdom was bankrupt until Joseph came along. Where did the money come from that God convinced Pharaoh to cough up and give to the people of God? Where did that money come from? From Joseph. Now think about that. God works so far in front of our curve, our learning curve. While you're worried about how you're going to pay the rent next month, God's already worked out for you to get your own house. But if you don't have the faith to believe for that, you ain't going to get that. You're going to be paying the man rent for the rest of your life. So all those, the finances had been built back up into Egypt just in time for their release from captivity. They spent 400 years going broke and having nothing. But while they were working as slaves, God was working to make them wealthy. Do you see the irony in that? 
While you think God's doing nothing, he's already providing for the next generation. While they're all complaining about this wicked taskmaster Pharaoh who beats them and doesn't feed them very well and makes them work all hours of the day and night and they have nothing to show for it except pig's food, basically. While they were complaining and whining, God said, in just a little while, I'm going to send you a deliverer, just like he sent Jesus. I'm going to send you a deliverer. And by the time the deliverer is ready, now look here, God's working in multiple phases. He's working with a guy, <clears throat> Moses, who killed a man, right? Because he was so enthusiastic about doing the works of the Hebrews, working with the Hebrews, because he was a Hebrew. All of that time, God's working with Moses, and it took the Lord 80 years to get his attention. But during those 80 years, Pharaoh was building up the money, and Moses was building up his heart for God until he saw the burning bush. He took his sandals off because God said, it's time now for you to be working for me. I want you to take off the trappings of the world and put on the sandals of the shoes of peace. And I want you to go and make peace with Pharaoh. Okay, Lord, but he won't believe me. He said, doesn't matter. He's not going to do it anyway. Well, what? You want me to go, but you don't want me to go? What do you want me to do? He said, I want you to go. But Pharaoh is not going to do what you tell him, even though what I'm telling you to do, you'll tell him. So then he says, throw your staff down on the ground. And it turns into a snake and then takes it back up again. The snake eats the other, the, with, with the magicians and all that stuff. He copies, first of all, God emulates what the Egyptians are able to do. And then he bests it. So during those testings with the, with, the, with, the musician, with, the musician, with the magicians, God says, now throw down your... He has experience now because he'd already shown Moses what to do. Throw your rod down <clears throat> and it became a bigger snake and ate their snake. He said he's going to knock himself out refusing to let you go. But after I'm finished with him, he'll let you go. Not only that, we're going to read here that he left with all the wealth, all the wealth of Egypt. Now, this is, the, this is the irony. Egypt went from bankrupt to a major economic power, then bankrupt again. And why did it go bankrupt? Because God was building it up for you. Now, when I say to you, each generation, each generation has its own exodus. You are of the final generation. Now, after we, we learned about the, the 70 weeks, right? The 69 weeks, which are years, six by seven. So we, we, we discovered that between the 69th and the 70th week, Jubilee week, that the Spirit of God is going to move in an entirely different way than he ever has before. But during that one week, that sabbatical week, it says that during that seven-year period, the changes that take place on this planet are going to be horrendous. The three and a half years with the breaking up. Now, I explained it to you. If you don't know what it, you know, ask me again and I'll teach it again for you. But the bottom line is the 70th week is elastic. And, and, and it's elastic because things have to take place that depend upon your heart. What happens during Jubilee is that there is a return and a restoration. Now, I taught you that, right? The 70th week represents the final Jubilee prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we know that the Jubilee period during Jesus' appearance, we find in Luke. Let me read that one to you first because it'll help you. When Jesus walks into the temple, picks up the Torah and begins to read out of the book of Isaiah and quotes in there the prophecy concerning his own coming. To proclaim, it says, the acceptable year of the Lord. The acceptable year of the Lord was in fact Jubilee. So when he got up in front of all the scribes and the Pharisees and began to read the, 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 the definition or the prophecy in Isaiah, he says, this day is this saying fulfilled in your ears. And he's telling them, I am the Messiah. I am proclaiming the Jubilee. This was the beginning of the period of time during Jesus' ministry, approximately three and a half years. If we read the book of Daniel, it says that after in fact, let me read it for you. Let me read Exodus first, all right? God speaking to Moses, he says, Speak to the children, this is verse, uh, chapter 14. Speak to the children of Israel that they term and encamp before Firoth, before Migdal, and the sea over against Balvon, or wherever it was. Before it, before it ye shall encamp by the sea. And Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he will follow after them. Why was he following after them? He wanted his money back. Something very strange happened during Moses' ministry to Pharaoh, and it says in, the, in Exodus 3 that uh, God had given favor. Chapter 2, verse 25, God looked upon the children of Israel and God had respect unto them. God was going to getting ready to honor them. And if we back it up to verse 23, it says it came to pass in the process of time the king of Egypt died. Now, that's, this, is, this is the guy that was doing bad stuff. And it says, and the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of their bondage. This is not Joseph's Pharaoh. This is the latter one. They cried and they cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groanings and God remembered his covenant with Abraham with Isaac and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel and had respect unto them. 
Hallelujah. Moving on forward. And in chapter 3, he goes on and starts talking here in verse 19. I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, not even by a mighty hand. But I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders. And after that, in the midst, after that, he will let you go. He'll do what I tell him eventually. And I will give this people favor. Everyone say favor. favor. I will give this people. What people? The Exodus people. Are you listening to me? Up until this time, the Bible says they had 400 years of misery. 400 years which they were paid nothing. But God was paying them a paycheck and putting it in an account for them. And who did he let to manage the account? Egypt and Pharaoh. In this case, we see the, the similitude here between God making preparation in advance for the people of God in this generation. Because we are now approaching the end of the 70th week, or the beginning of the 70th week. At the beginning of that 70th week, that's when we're going to find Antichrist being exposed. That's where we're going to find the, the allegiance of the nations of the foreign nations all come together with an economy that is three to four times more powerful than the United States. The only thing that's holding Europe back, the European nations back, A, they don't have a universal currency. Do some Googling, you'll discover that they do now. And it's not been released yet, but it's called a Euro something. It's a special Euro. Anybody seen that? That's going to be the universal currency of the entire globe. What's stopping them from doing that right now? Because the Federal Reserve now has the right to print US dollars. We are the reserve currency. And because of that, we are not tangibly bankrupt, but we are bankrupt. The, the United States dollar is worth like 15 cents now. When, when Nixon got off the gold standard, everything went down the tubes. You've got to get the big picture now because now we are approaching, if I'm right, and I believe I am, and if you go back to Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 9 and take those years back, and to the time when Jesus was cut off, but not of himself, that means he was crucified. And if you back those timetables back from the time that uh, the temple was rebuilt, uh, you'll come to the number plus or minus 28 AD. The cutting off of Jesus Christ was in his late, early, late 20s or early 30s. During that period of time, a lot of things have to change. And one of those things that's going to change is the euro dollar is going to come under the... They're going to call it... They don't have a name for it anyway. It's, it's a euro something. By that time that comes in, the only thing that's holding them back is the United States can print much more money as it wants. And right now, Trump is doing a great job about building up our reserves, just like Pharaoh did, building up our reserves. When the United States takes a reverse, and it will, then Europe is going to come out with its euro dollar... And it's going to do all it can now to bankrupt the United States. Because while the United States is still in a position of authority and power, economic substance, it will resist any attempt to take over the globe. When you see that peace contract signed, and it will be, when you see that peace contract signed, put a big circle around seven years because that's when it starts. During three and a half years when that, when that period of peace is, 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 is broken, the true nature of the Antichrist spirit is going to come out. And when it comes out, one of its major adversaries is going to be the United States. Who will be the, the Antichrist's eventual uh, nemesis? Interestingly enough, Israel. Israel will eventually reject Antichrist. Did you know that? Do you know when it's going to happen? Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib. Post-trib. The time of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ will signal the end of tribulation. Now, the Bible says, and I'm just giving you an idea now, who's coming out of Egypt? Egypt's a type of the world system, right? So you all in this house, for the most part that I know, are either A, being called back, into a mode of restoration, or they're backsliding. It's called the apostasy. The apostasy is when men and women do not choose to maintain their salvation, but rather having itching ears seek for themselves their own teachers. Now, the big new push here is going to be false prophets, and you, you haven't seen them yet, but you're going to see them, and they're going to have all the panache and all the suave that you have ever seen before in your life. They'll have all the right words, they'll look good, smell good, they look great on camera, but they will eventually pervert you and, and, and dissuade you away from your first love to something else that you can love. What is it that you want to love more than God? Yourself. People are going to be eventually pushed more and more towards self-worship, doing what I want to do, when I want to do it, if I want to do it. And for people to try to do that is controlling. You try to control me. Into, no, no. See, if you love somebody, you don't have to worry about you being controlled. Because you love them and you know they love you, you're willing to make sacrifices for that. That's, that's how it is with the love of God. The only thing that keeps this world spinning on its axis 
here's Jesus now, Luke chapter 4, uh, 17 through 21. Jesus in the temple uh, where he describes himself as Messiah. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah and when he had opened the book he found the place where it was written. He went looking for it. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now this is you, right? Preach the gospel to the poor, sent me to heal the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind and set at liberty those who are oppressed. An absolute dramatic fulfillment of the book of Exodus. And he's saying to himself, he's saying to the people, the Jubilee year is here and I'm the one that's going to usher in your deliverance. And that began when he was cut off. 27 to 31 AD. Next verse, 19. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's the year of Jubilee. Now what happened in Jubilee? Well, we shared with it last week, but basically it was return and restoration. Jesus said, I am leading you back to your promised land. Do You know, the Bible says that the promised land is not what most people would think it is because it was inhabited with Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, all those ites were in there. And giants were in the land, men who had uh, genetic issues of which the sons of Gath were there, the, the giants that David fought, one of them had five sons. They're all giants, big people. And Jesus was saying, from this day on, look to me because I'm going to take you back to your promised land. Now we understand the promised land to be Israel per se, but when Jesus comes back to return us to the promised land, it won't be just Israel, it will be Jerusalem. And the book of Revelation says that the time is coming when the new Jerusalem will descend from heaven with a shout. Now, that's referring to Jesus as well as a jubilee, but at the same time it's saying that the physical inhabitants of Jerusalem will be known as the church, and eventually a thousand years of peace will rule and reign. The end of that period, of course, Jesus Christ hands the kingdom intact and in power back to the Father. Now, I want you to remember these scriptures and write them down because people are going to ask you this. You're going to start seeing more and more of the Christian TV quoting Daniel, quoting... Because in the hearts of these men and women, there is a knowledge that's beginning to percolate that lets people know, look up, your redemption's coming. Messiah is coming just as soon as Moses came, Jesus came, he's coming again. But before he comes again, certain things have to take place. When Jesus talks about the restoration of Jubilee, he's, he's, he's speaking there specifically about Israel, but more importantly, Jerusalem. And that what eventually will happen, it says in Acts, that the fullness of the Gentiles have to come in. That's you and me, unless you have Jewish blood in you. The fullness of the Gentiles has to come in before Jews can be saved. Every time I speak about the coming of the Messiah and the funding of the people of God through Pharaoh's wealth, both now and then, the building up of the wealth of the United States, which is doing a great job right now of, of uh, amassing wealth. For who? For you. Now, not everybody that's a Christian is benefiting yet, but the increase in wealth in the United States is going to be like it's always been. It's always been the top percentage. But the wealth is always going to trickle down to the top 5%. The working class, the communists don't like it because they want control of it. And while the wealthy are in control, the majority of whom are Jews, <laughs> they just are, because God gave them the gift to gather up. Uh, when, the, when the three sons of, of, of uh, Noah were birthed, they went throughout the whole world, populating the world. So here's a thought for you, just while we're talking and thinking about it. The whole of the earth is populated event originally from Adam and Eve. We are all God's seed. We are all God's seed. And when the caveat is that when God sends Jubilee and the return of the Lord, he's, the Jesus is not just coming back for everybody. He's coming back for his people. Now, we could say well, we all have an inheritance in, the, in Israel. Well, we really do if you go back to the original parents, Adam and Eve. But your salvation is based not on your connection with Israel. Your salvation is connected directly to Yeshua HaMashiach. So those of us who pursue Jubilee, we are pursuing the Son of God. We are pursuing Yeshua. And as we pursue Yeshua, we have to follow him all the way out from Egypt, through the wilderness, into the promised land, and ultimately into Jerusalem, metaphorically speaking. You have to stay with Yeshua the whole journey. So, when we left Egypt, not everybody that left Egypt made it to the promised land. Good God Almighty, Moses didn't even make it, you know? Because Moses was a bit of a roughneck, just like Peter. A little bit rough around the edges, a little bit serrated, but serrated blades cut pretty good. So iron sharpeneth iron. So the longer the rougher ones stay connected to Yeshua, the, the, the sharper we get. And we don't have to hack people up to get to their heart. But what does cut the deepest is the sharpest. So we find a situation now where the people of God have to prepare themselves to go the whole way with God. Salvation is a contract between God and you, not between you and God. Now think about that. Which one would you rather keep your word? You think you're more likely to keep your word or is God more likely to keep his word? <laughs> 
That's what keeps you ticking. So the Lord says, the only thing you have to do to make it in the promised land is follow the instructions of the prophet, if he really is one, right? Follow his instructions. And you'll not lack for food. You'll not lack for drink. In fact, the psalmist says, the shoes didn't even wear out on their feet. And there was not one sickly one amongst them. When the majority of those folks came out, they were quite happy to follow Moses out into the wilderness. But then something started to happen. The people started murmuring and complaining and leaving their churches. Where are you going to go, Bubba? Somewhere where I'm welcome. Somewhere along the line you got the idea that your instructions are unwelcome. But without instructions, what happened? Well, let's look to the book. So what happened? So they went wandering out the wilderness. And then there started to be some complainers rise up and actually challenge Moses. Moses said, these people don't like me very much. And God said, who are these people? These people with their dark sayings who murmur and complain in their tents about you, which means I'm hearing it. Who are these people? Don't they realize that I speak to my servant face to face? God says, separate them all out. I'm going to kill them all. And most of them, please don't do that. This church has been following me all the way out from Pharaoh's domain. It's hard enough for them to get along as it is because they have so much gold and silver they drag it along with them. But it's not the gold and the silver that is benefiting them because that's to build your temple with. But they are complaining about the food. And you know, you know what happened after all that, right? And then the ones that continued to complain, God said, I'm going to lead them to their own promised land, which they liked the idea of that. So they got their own leadership together and they started another church in the wilderness. They were in there for 40 years. And God says, leave them out there until they all drop dead. Then I'm going to take the ones that stayed faithful to me and have allowed me to lead them all the way out from Egypt and I will get them into the promised land. Maybe not by Moses because I've got to spank him because he didn't do the right thing. But we find out later Moses is appearing up on the mount he made it just fine into the presence of God. But God said, to him, you'll not step into the promised land. So that's how I know that the presence of God is not the promised land. The presence of God has always been and always will be Jerusalem. Here's the major difference that as we, the Gentiles, move along in this journey of faith until the evolution of that final seven-year period, and we understand how that operates, and the revealing of Antichrist, the timing for that departure is already here. We're already on the journey. But got to remember this, saints. Your journey is an individual one. Your journey is your journey. Your appearance before the Lord will be your appearance before the Lord. It won't be you and your husband. It'll just be you. And you'll give an account. That's an accounting term. It'll give an account of what you've done in the flesh, in the body, not just spiritual acts, but I'm talking about living your life, how, how you've lived it, and your relationship with Yeshua. That's where we have to feed our salvation and keep it alive and keep it strong. And be wary of all the things that I'm trying to teach you, not to bum you out, just to get you to realize that you are an elite group. You are an elite group, not elite from an intellectual point of view, but an elite from a spiritual perspective. You are a royal priesthood, a chosen generation, a chosen generation. And because of that, you have to understand what's coming on the earth and how to handle it. And we shared with you a number of scriptures, two in particular, one in Luke, the other in Matthew, which says the sign of the Son of Man in the clouds, coming in the clouds, will not happen until after the tribulation has almost run its course. Why do we say almost run its course? Because even though I believe that we will go through hardship, trial and tribulation, such as never the world has seen, Jesus said. But for the elect's sake, it's going to be cut short. Because if it were possible, even you, the elect, that's the, that's the body of Christ, the elected, the body of Christ, even you could be deceived and perish. So I'm going to cut that timing short so that those of you who have been faithful to the end will be rewarded and honored into the kingdom. And when the, when the Lord appears in the clouds, it says that we'll be caught up together to meet him in the clouds. Because what's happening on the earth is, is pretty bad, right? So he is going to rapture you up if you want to. But the rapture is not to remove you as much as it is to preserve you. You see what I'm saying? Because by that point, there's a lot of things coming on the earth and amongst the body of Christ, if we are fortunate enough to be alive when he comes, that we're going to be about the Father's business. vis V, what are we going to need? Strong faith, resilience, teachability, and money. Because you're going to have to buy stuff, right? So what I'm trying to tell you is that the world system and the tribulation are going to make it extremely difficult for you to make a living. Three and a half years into that in that agreement period with Antichrist, you've got to remember it's not just Antichrist, it's the system. And he's, he's got some of the most powerful countries in the world gathered together under his leadership. Because amongst other things, he's going to be a great politician, a great statesman. And if you look back in history, that spirit of Antichrist has always existed in men, primarily because the scripture always has men, not that he doesn't use women, but 
the men have always been the authoritative figures. And of course, Antichrist wants to change that. He wants another woman to be in the President of the United States. And uh, I don't believe that's going to happen, at least not now. But certainly, the understanding that in the last days, the necessity of God's people being able to take care of themselves by God's grace is going to be paramount. Because during the first three and a half years, then he says that Antichrist will perform a number of things. It says the, the, the prophet Daniel talked about the desolation of the temple. Desecration is, is a more accurate word. And at the same time that there is going to be a, a, a removal of God's people being able to bring sacrifice into the temple. It's in the book of Daniel, read it. All of these things mean it's going to make it really difficult and really hard on God's people who are alive at that time. If it were not for the grace of God and the favor of God, causing people to give them things, the same as he gave them favor before the Egyptians. You're going to have to start looking, my brothers and sisters, for examples of how God is going to deliver favor to you. And don't become lacking in passion to see God move and do miraculous things. It'll be according to the book of Exodus, and you shall borrow, and I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it'll come to pass that when you go, you will not go empty. Deuteronomy 8, 18b, it's God that giveth thee the power or the authority, spiritual authority, to speak those things that are not as if they are. You get to a point in God when you can believe him for it, you'll speak it, God will do it, because you're speaking what his book says. Isaiah made a statement that when the, when the Jews finally back up on the Antichrist, two-thirds of them will be killed. And a third of the Jews that are left in Israel uh, will become great supporters of Yeshua. Strong, able, prayerful ministers of the gospel. Because you see, when people say, well, during this period of tribulation, we're all going to be caught up in everything. Even the scriptures I shared with you dispute that. But at the same time, how in the world can God's people expect a breakthrough in the Lord unless they have the faith to believe for it? Really important that you should understand the prodigal son and daughters coming home because the definition of jubilee, in particular the last week, the seven years, the jubilee period and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the, and the sound of the trump, which is the feast of trumpets, the sound of the trump sounds and immediately the Lord will appear in the clouds. There'll be a, uh, there'll be a change take place and your physical body will be changed in the twinkling of an eye and you'll be caught up to meet in the clouds so that you'll ever be with the Lord. Awesome. But we need to learn. See, from that very split second, everything you need to know about God, about heaven, about faith, it'll all be given to you in a split second. You'll know all things. The things that you need to know, you will know. Paul says we know in part, we prophesy in part, right? But then we won't need to know anything because we'll know it already. You'll be a walking, talking replica of Yeshua. So to me, that's the exciting part. But I want to know how to handle things you know, as we get there. The prodigal tells you each generation, each generation has its own exodus. Every generation will find its way back home, Wanda. Every generation finds its way back home because this is your home. There's not a person in here that doesn't know you and love you. And all of you for that matter and for me. But you have to give people the liberty either to wander off into the wilderness. You see, it's by God's grace that he called you back. You've been through a lot. We've all been through stuff, right? Now you think, I just don't know. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm, I'm done. I'm cooked. That's it. No more. Thank you. Sorry, Jesus, I said that. I didn't really mean that. <laughs> you know? And so what's he going to do? He's going to bring the prodigal children back. Why would he leave his children eating pig food in a house where there's no love for God? Well, what's, what's he waiting on? He's waiting for the prodigals to cry out. And if you read the story, it's awesome. It's not just about Jews and Gentiles. That's what I was taught. It's not true. It is, but it isn't. Notice he says that the Jew receives the adoration of the Father to a greater extent, the Gentile, I should say, in, if we're going to be looking at the, the younger son who grabbed his inheritance and took off as a Gentile, all right? And the other son who was Jewish and stayed at home and did, he was a good little boy and did everything the Father told him. When the Gentile comes back or the unbeliever or the prodigal who's taken off, the backslider, once he's taken off, the father just had to go every day to the mountaintop and look to see where he was in the hope that he would be coming over the hill and ask his daddy to take him back home. And he waited a long time until this guy was almost starving and spent everything he had. All the blessings that the father had given him, he just wasted it. That means his relationship with the father was cut. Then he says, I'm going to do what I want to do. Apostasy. I'm going to fall away, do what I want to do, eat what I want to eat, till one day, he says. Now, what's the one day, he says? That's the generational exodus. Every generation has its prodigals. We're starting to see those prodigals come back. But 
The enemy is not going to come upon you unawares and, and sucker punch you. You're going to know what's going on. And then you become valuable to your brothers and sisters who have lost their way. Just like the ones that wandered off in the wilderness and died there, a whole bunch of people are going to wander off and die there for different reasons. But this generation, and if the Lord tarries the following generation, which I don't think we're going to see because we're approaching all the little signposts now. The signing of that seven-year treaty is going to be the beginning of it. But there's a lot of other things that I see too that other people maybe don't see. But I have an expectation in my heart that things are going to move increasingly faster and faster and faster. You and I have already noticed that. Time's spinning. It's just spinning. Like, you look at the calendar, it's going to be Christmas again before long. Good grief. The compression of time, that's all part of it. So I want you to read that story again of the prodigal and ask the Lord to reveal to you the things you need to know. Now let's say, how do I actually rep how do I return? How does the prodigal return? He does it by repenting. I don't know why people have such a problem with that. Repent, you can be baptized, each one of you. Well, I was baptized. Well, do it again if you feel comfortable. But repentance is the incredible ticket to ride that God presents to every one of you. Without repentance, there can be no return. Without a return, there's no restoration. If there's no restoration, then you're not saved. Now, I know that's a troubling thought, but if you're in doubt, take care of it. I wrote this little note down just to help remind you that the Jews lost all of their ancestral lands, but they will also be included in Jubilee. Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 27. Why have I spent so much time on this? Because A, I want you to understand how God's going to provide for you in a difficult time, and a difficult season, and how God will continue to provide for you if you have faith to believe it. He doesn't want to see you both busted or disgusted. He wants to see you fully provisioned, loaded down with the world's substance, including food, health, all that stuff. When he brought them out, he brought them out without any sickness, no disease. And, and, and the body of Christ, we need to relearn those lessons. Romans 11, 25. For I don't desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinions that blindness in part has happened to Israel. Blindness. They can't see it until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Next verse, 26. And so, and in the Greek, it says, and so shall it be that. So it's future tense. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written, that the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. In other words, the remnant of the Jews will also be included in, but not until the figure of the Gentiles has been restored. Now, that means that there has to be a falling away first. And then the prodigals have to make a decision. The ones that haven't stayed strong all this time, and you haven't lived the kind of life you should have all this time. The prodigals are the ones that made up their mind, I need to be in my father's house. I don't need to be doing what I'm doing now. And repent. And God says he'll welcome you back. They become part of the Gentiles' fullness. Because God is just and faithful, but he's full of, full of kindness and full of mercy and grace. You see, that's kept me alive for years, literally. Verse 27. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. That simply means in, the, in, in, in original terms, they received my salvation. They ran from my salvation. But it says... My covenant with them will remain when I wash their sins away. Very comforting, isn't it? Come on now, saints of God. Romans chapter 9, verse 27. Go there for me. Look at this Isaiah, which is quoting the same, is, is the prophecy, the original prophecy. Cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea. This is interesting. Only, original text, the remnant will be saved. See that? They will pay a price for their dismission their dismissal of Yeshua but a remnant will be saved because they will resist the rule of Antichrist and because that resistance continues the remnant of the Israel of Israel the remnant of the Jewish people will be saved and they will resist Antichrist and they will resist his taking over the world system that resistance will invoke those other powers to come down and invade Israel all of these things are very close some of the original countries and I mentioned to you one in particular uh, Iran which is Latter-day Persia, the Medes and the Persians. This is what's left over of the country of Iran. Now look what's happened to them. However, Peter says that in the last days, just as Noah was rescued from the flood waters, that this earth will never be destroyed against by flood, but it'll be by fire. And the only thing that causes the atmosphere to catch on fire is nuclear, th uh, thermonuclear weapons, which actually turn the atmosphere into flame. It sets on fire the actual atmosphere. But be encouraged, there's a new heavens and a new earth. I've got to read you this. You're going to love this. The Jews rejecting Antichrist is found in Revelation chapter 12. If you want to look at that. Verses 13 through 17. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Who was that? K 
capital M, male, capital C, child. Who is that? It's got to be Jesus, doesn't it? And it says he, the Antichrist began to persecute Israel. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time, times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. This is the breaking of the covenant and then the, the people of Israel flee from the persecution of Antichrist. Let's have another look. Revelation chapter 22, verse 14. Jesus speaks a lot about paradise. Remember when Jesus was resurrected from the cross, paradise became available to him. When we think of paradise, we should be thinking of the Garden of Eden, right? It was the original paradise, was it not? What does the word jubilee mean? Return and restore. That means to bring it back to its original state. Now when Jesus gave up the spirit on that cross, he said to the thief next to him, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Right. At that point, Eden became available to him again. And Eden will become available to you again too. And because of the great work that the Holy Spirit is doing in these last days to restore not just the Gentile, but God's people too. Listen to this scripture, Revelation 22 verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments that they might have the right or the restoration of the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city, not the country, the city. What city? New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem, restored, redeemed, and under the headship of Jesus Christ. Now look at this, next verse. Be, uh, but outside are the dogs and the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, idolaters, ho uh, uh, whoever loves and practices a lie. Now we're talking about people, when you read that initially, you think, oh, people who are liars. But it means more than that. Who practices a lie are ones that practice pagan culture. The ones that have departed from the living God and are now serving numerous other gods. That's practicing a lie because they are not gods. They are humans that have died. Jesus is Messiah who is alive. I want to try to help you think more pragmatically. That's just a word which means connected to reality. Pragmatically connected to Jesus rather than just a churchgoer. And the reason I'm doing all this now is just to prepare your hearts and your mind because when you see that news headline kick up, today President Trump has announced the initial organization or the initial uh, drafting of a peace agreement between Palestine. And when that happens, you should let out a hoot and a holler. Other people have tried it, but never, you know, all the way back to the peanut farmer. They've all tried it, none come up with it. But when you see that agreement being signed, pay very careful attention to, to who was at that meeting. In particular, look at the major powers in Europe, and in particular, Germany and France, particularly France. The current leader of France, I believe is going to have particular connection to that meeting and to the one agenda which he's been pushing very hard lately, which is the birthing of the Antichrist Union, the European Union. All of those things have to come into account that we've talked about today. Financially, by the euro, the new euro, and the collapse of the US dollar, which is a ways off, but not that far. All that has to happen with that is that China gets very aggravated with the United States and starts calling in all their bonds. If they did that, they would crash the economy in the United States because we can't pay it. We'd be bankrupt. Why aren't they doing it now? Because it's in their interest to see what, he, see what he's doing with all the, uh, the uh, tariffs and stuff. I mean, he's, he's costing them billions. But it's really all the money. See, again, this is the funding of God's people. Think about it. What's going on in the world to make the transference of wealth. It's amazing. Right now it's happening inter-country. The next step is going to start flowing into your pockets. It's going to flow into your pockets because you are going to take the kingdom of God by violence. I tell you, I don't want to be in an environment where I'm not continually provoked to acts of violence for God. Now that word doesn't mean killing, maiming, destroying. It means doing what's necessary to proclaim the liberty wherein Christ has set me free. See, the four guys that picked him up on a bed and tore the roof off the guy's house. And when they lowered him down in this bed, and Jesus proclaimed deliverance over him, rewarding the faith of his friends, and an act of apparent violence being rewarded by deliverance and by healing. The same blessings await you and I, and I've put them to the test over 37 years. Behold, I come quickly, verse 12 of chapter 22. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Redeem and restore, to give every man every man according to his work so shall it be i am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end the first and the last blessed are they that do his commandments for they have the right 
to the tree of life by entering through the gates of the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers, whoremongers, murderers, idolaters, whoever loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify these things to you. In the churches I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and the morning star. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. Whoever will, let him freely take the water of life. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to these words, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in it. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book and of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly, saith the Lord, even so come. Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all.